The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, welcome back to 6890. Uh, today, we're going to look at a bunch of different graph problems. That is their unifying feature, their problems on graphs. We're going to look at vertex cover. Uh, we're going to look at uh, vertex coloring of graphs. And we're going to look at some ordering problems on graphs. And I think one more, orientations of graphs. Uh, so these are all going to be some kind of constraint that we place on the graph or something we want to do with the graph. Um, this is sort of a miscellaneous lecture. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about 3SAT, most recently Hamiltonicity, and before all that, 3Partition, which are the most popular, most useful, I would say, uh, ways of doing NP-hardness reductions. But there are a few others that are good to know that are sometimes relevant, and so this is that. Uh, each one is a little bit smaller in content, so we're just going to lump them all together. Uh, so we'll start with vertex cover. Uh, we saw this slide from lecture four, I think, uh, from planar 3SAT. Uh, Lichtenstein uh, proved planar vertex cover is hard. Vertex cover, remember, is this problem. Uh, You want to choose a set of vertices, let's say k vertices, to hit all the edges. Um, a different way of thinking about this problem, and a lot of these problems you can think of in a more logical context, formulas and so on, uh, this is essentially a form of 2SAT uh, with k true uh, variables. It's even uh, positive 2SAT. Uh, because you essentially you can think of there being a variable for each edge, for each vertex, whether you choose it. And then the edge is just stating the constraint that you should choose one or the other of the endpoints. And so that's a 2SAT constraint. Uh, and 2SAT is easy. But when you say, I want to solve 2SAT with only setting k of the variables to be true, then it becomes this NP-hard problem vertex cover. And so we have, this was a reduction from planar 3SAT to planar vertex cover. So we know this problem is hard. Uh, let's use it for some things. Uh, and let's also prove some even more special versions, uh, or some, uh, some more related versions are hard. So this one was already uh, maximum degree 3. Might have some, if we have some unused copies, we'll get degree two ver uh, vertices, but certainly every vertex is at most degree three, and it was planar, so that's already cool. Uh, planar max degree three is hard. Uh, some polynomial versions to be careful of if you're using vertex cover as a starting point. Uh, one is what I call exact vertex cover. Uh, each edge is uh, incident to exactly one chosen vertex. So vertex cover could be one or the other. Uh, if you have uh, exclusively or between those two, it's easy. Um, and another version, sort of the dual between uh, vertices and edges, we might call it edge cover, which would be choose k edges to hit all vertices. An exact edge cover perfect matching? Exact, exact vertex cover is perfect matching. Thank you. Uh, this is also essentially maximum cardinality matching, because uh, the more you can be 
a matching, the more efficient you're going to be. And then every isolated vertex, after you have a maximum cardinality matching, you just have to cover those with one more. So both of these reduce to matching. So, but it's obvious in hindsight, but <laughs> be careful if you're ever doing vertex cover not to accidentally uh, do one of these. OK, so there's some warnings. Here's an, a cool version of vertex cover. It can be useful. We'll use it in a moment to prove a particular problem hard. Connected vertex cover. So usually, with a vertex cover, you imagine you're just grabbing vertices from all over the graph. With connected vertex cover, you require that the chosen vertices induce a connected subgraph. So this is not obviously easier or harder as a problem. It's more restrictive on the cover. Uh, but we can prove that it's NP-hard uh, by a reduction from this problem. And so in particular, we get that it's NP-hard for uh, planar max degree 4 graphs. Here's the reduction. I think this reduction is quite cool because it, it uses planarity. It may not be necessary to use planarity, but this reduction definitely uses planarity in a rich way. Uh, even though, uh, So even if you're trying to prove this without planarity, it'd be kind of more awkward. So suppose you have a planar graph. You want to find a minimum vertex cover in this graph. We're going to modify the graph in this way. Uh, this is yet another Gary and Johnson paper. Uh, so you can see the original faces of the graph. And then for each face, we're going to add in uh, sort of a copy of the face. Um, so also the outside face gets this kind of curvy copy. Um, and so in particular, at every vertex, there's now going to be five copies of the vertex, one on the one incident face, one on the other incident face. And then for every one of these, we're going to have an extra leaf hanging off. Why leaves? Leaves are really cool, or really annoying, or whatever. They're um, very forceful in the case of vertex cover. If you look at a leaf, uh, so here's a leaf. It's connected to some vertex. It's presumably not a leaf. Otherwise, that would be an isolated component. Um, it's never useful to put this in the vertex cover. If you decide to put this in the vertex cover, you might as well choose this guy instead, because this covers more covers all the edges that this one did, namely that one edge, and some other edges. Maybe it was already in the vertex cover, then it wasn't minimum, then you got smaller. Uh, but you can assume there is an optimal solution where you never put leaves in the vertex cover. Uh, what that means is if you, uh, wherever we add a leaf like this, it basically forces you, it lets you know that you might as well have this in the vertex cover. Ev there is an optimal solution where this is in the vertex cover. Because the only other option is that this one is, and then you can move it over. So these vertices on the copies of the faces, those are all forced to be in the cover, which means this entire copy of the face, the inset copy of the face, is completely covered already. Plus, these edges are covered, connecting the inner copy of the face to the original face. Uh, now. We have to be, so there's still stuff to cover. Um, so in particular, it's still interesting to put one of the original vertices in the cover. That would cover these three. Now they're, uh, the, every edge got cut into three parts. So this would be, this would cover one third of the edge. The idea is if you put this in the cover and you cover those three guys, uh, we still have to cover these two. And we'll do that by putting this vertex in the cover. Because uh, one of these two has to be in in order to cover this middle edge. Uh, and the idea is that you'll be able to just put one of them in. You'll put, be able to put exactly one of these two on every subdivided edge, if and only if there is a vertex cover of the right size. So if I do the arithmetic here, uh, claim is we added exactly 
five times the, num the original number of edges uh, to the vertex cover, to the optimal vertex cover. Five because uh, for every original edge, uh, we added two here, two here, and then one of these two. So there were six sort of vertices around this edge that we added. Uh, and if, if we can cover, say, this edge using that vertex or cover this edge using that vertex, which is the same as saying that this original edge is covered by one side or the other, then we only need one of these two guys. And then we'll get away with just five per edge. So if the original thing, the original thing has a vertex cover of size k, if and only if this new thing has the vertex cover of size k plus five times the number of edges. Question? Um, what stops you from taking one of the, uh, well, you, you... Taking both of these, for example? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good thing to worry about. Maybe you take both, and then you don't have to choose either one, so it doesn't look like a vertex cover. But this is a similar argument to the leaves. If you choose both of these guys, because you know that these, the other four are there, you can always move one of them to the vertex. So you'll get a recover a vertex cover. Yeah. Don't you need five times the edges plus like the number of vertices because you also have to cover the leaves off the vertices? The, these leaves? No, oh, these the ones. Vertices. Ah, whoops. Oh, so it looks like they're always increasing the degree to four. A connected vertex cover is actually an important problem. People think about it a lot uh, for some kind of uh, networking applications. You want to build some backbone that can reach everybody. You need a connected network. Um, but uh, the Gary and Johnson's original motivation for introducing that problem uh, is rectilinear Steiner tree, also an important networking problem. Steiner tree is about, uh, you. usually you're, you imagine you're given some, you're given some space where you can build a network and you're given some things that you want to interconnect. So maybe you're building a new city you've, uh, around some existing houses. So you're given some points in the plane that represent houses. Now you want to build roads to connect them all together. You want to minimize the amount of roads you have to build. Uh, so you're going to build a tree. And Steiner tree means that you can add intersections wherever you want, uh, as opposed to a uh, minimum spanning tree, where you can only turn at the given vertices. See so if you have some points uh, like this in the plane. Uh, the, the best way to connect them together in the Euclidean metric is to have, I uh, didn't draw it super well, but to have 120 degree angles uh, at all the intersections, something you can prove. Here we're thinking about rectilinear Steiner tree, which is a version where, sort of the Manhattan version, where you're only allowed to draw uh, orthogonal connections like that. So you can still add extra vertices if you want to minimize the total length of these connections given n points in the plane. This problem is np hard. And you can prove it in a very simple way. This is the reduction <laughs> uh, from the previous problem. So the first step is, and the reason they care about max degree 4 in the previous problem, is to draw the graph in the plane in an orthogonal drawing. So every vertex becomes a point. Every edge becomes some orthogonal path connecting two vertices. We've done that in previous proofs. So now everything's drawn in the plane, something like this. And then at each vertex, we're going to erase a little circle of radius 2. Uh, and then that leaves a bunch of segments and the segments connected together. Uh, and now we're just going to place along those segments a whole bunch of points. And so the idea is that the Steiner tree should connect all those together. And then it's left with a choice. Uh, and those are all going to be distance 1 apart. And it's left with a choice of where to connect things together, which vertices. Uh, so a little bit more formally, what's going on? Each of these edges is going to be scaled up by a huge factor, 4 times n squared, uh, where n, I think, is the dimension of the grid, n by n grid. So these are of the original grid, the dashed lines. So we're going to, uh, originally when you draw it on a, on a graph, on a, on a grid, you imagine probably these are unit length. Scale it up to length 4n squared. And then uh, the rule is wherever you have an integer point along that line, add a dot. And so they will be spaced with distances of 1. Over here, we have distances of 2 between the vertex, which is not actually a point in the set. Uh, and here, and so a distance of 4 between any 
pairs of those points. Because these distances are so huge, you never want to connect from here to anywhere else that's not at this local intersection. Okay, so, and the, there's an argument about that looking at the, these sort of regions of where you could possibly want to go, and there's only those uh, endpoints in there, and these are really cheap to connect, so it really only pays to connect things in between. Uh, so uh, basically, you show that you're forced to do all the unit length connections, and now you just have to make the thing connected. Question? Why two? Because uh, two is bigger than one. <coughs> yeah? I guess so the vertex cover is that you'd want to fill in that whole cross, but maybe there's a fear that you would just connect. No. Your you won't fill in the whole cross in the vertex cover. Let me tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. I agree. This proof is, I mean, the reduction is super simple, but the argument is confusing. So, uh, Here's the idea. Um, So there's essentially two things going on, but let's, let's first th think about the case where I give you a connected vertex cover of some size. What I'm going to do is uh, first, or you can think of it in, in either order, I, I'm in particular going to connect all of the vertices together. Now there's no particular reason to connect the vertices, but I'm just going to do it anyway, or think about doing it anyway, um, by a spanning tree. So there's lots of redundant connectivity here. I don't need to connect this to this to this all the way around. I can drop one of those connections because I'm just, uh, I just need to be connected. I just need a spanning tree. And in general, uh, there are V vertices to connect together. Uh, and each one of them costs uh, two in a certain sense. To connect a vertex to an incident edge costs two. And so uh, the V minus one edges in the spanning tree, so I'm going to pay that. On the other hand, I also need that every edge is connected to some vertex. That's the vertex cover constraint. And so every edge is going to pay two in order to connect to a vertex. So the weird thing here is the, the involvement of the vertices, even though there's no point there. Um, that's funny. Uh, maybe we could add a point there and make it a little clearer. But, um, Instead of thinking about connections from edges to edges, which would cost four, that's sort of the wrong way to think about it because there's two things going on. One is just to get the edges to connect to something, and then there's getting all the somethings connected together. So this is sort of a spanning tree thing, and this is a more of the vert actual vertex cover constraint. Together, they give the connected vertex cover constraint. It would be impossible for, rec for Steiner tree to do one without the other. Uh, but Essentially, uh, I mean, I'm going to wave my hands a little bit here, but you work it out in all cases, the number of uh, connections you need is exactly this if there's a vertex cover, and this will have to go up if there isn't a vertex cover. That was vertex cover. Let's do coloring. This will be, I think, more fun. Uh, so. First, let's prove that coloring is hard. Uh, so in general, uh, your the coloring problem, also called chromatic number, you're given a graph and you're given a number k. You want to color the vertices of the graph using k different colors. So that's a, a mapping from the vertices to the colors, such that no edge is uh, monochromatic. So you want a mapping, let's call it C, from the vertices to 1 up to K, such that 
uh, for every edge, let me call it uh, VW. Uh, the color of V does not equal the color of W. So that's the no monochromatic edge constraint. It's the usual coloring for vertex coloring. You can also talk about edge coloring and so on. Uh, and this problem is easy if k is 1 then you better not have any edges. It's easy if k is 2. That's bipartiteness testing. You can just greedily color, and you can never make a mistake unless the graph isn't bipartite. But it becomes hard when k equals 3. So it's a fun transition. And so here is why vertex 3 coloring is hard. It's proved by Gary Johnson Stockmeyer. Uh, reduction from 3SAT. So we have, on the one hand, a variable gadget. We're going to represent xi and xi bar like this. Um, this. This, I mean, coloring should feel a lot like SAT. In fact, this is, uh, you might think of this as XOR2 SAT, if you think of XOR as the not equals operator. But uh, it's over ternary uh, logic. So this gets back to a question from class. What about ternary logic? You can think of three coloring as like ternary logic. Uh, just like on the problem set. So um, what we're going to do is have this, we're going to have one copy of this gadget. I call it a colors gadget. It's just a triangle. And so all three colors must appear on that triangle. Uh, we don't know in what order, but we don't really care. We can just define the one that this, w the color that this guy's assigned, we'll call it red. Could be one, two, or three, but it doesn't matter. Call the one that this one, the color that this guy's assigned green, and this one blue. And hopefully you're not sufficiently colorblind to be unable to distinguish those. But I did check with a colorblind tester. They do seem at least different. Uh, but it might be hard to know the names. All right, so this green vertex is connected to both xi and xi bar for each of the variables, which means they can either be red or blue. And I want red to mean false, blue to mean true. So that's cool. That's nice regular binary logic. And then we're going to combine those variables with this clause gadget. Clause gadget also has one node out at the end here connected to both green and red, which forces it to be blue. But otherwise, it's kind of free. So we have instances of literals. These don't have to be the positive forms. This could be xi bar, xj bar, or whatever. And now we're going to think about coloring. So let me show you a couple of possible colorings. Uh, here's a valid coloring. It's valid because at least this is going to be three sets. So at least one of these should be true. True means blue. This guy is blue. And in general, so what we're doing is kind of taking a, an OR of this pair and then an OR of that pair with this one variable, one, one literal, I should say. And uh, because this is not red, I can put red here. Again, all three colors must appear. So in general, what I want to do, you'll see why in a moment, is push the reds as far back as possible. So if I can put a red OR red here or here, I'm happy. And I put some other color over there. Uh, I guess I'll put, yeah, any, any it doesn't matter whether, which one is blue or green here. As long as I can put red back here, I can also put red back here. And it could be, if this one is blue, I could also put the red guy here. I have a flexibility. But as long as I can put red either here or here, this one will not be red. And furthermore, I can make it not green. And that's what these constraints tell me. They should not be. This vertex should not be red or green. That's satisfied here. And the one, and that's, you can show, you can check all cases, or just uh, sort of go through that argument. Um, the only bad case is when they're all red, because then, just looking at this triangle, the red one has to be pushed forward. And then because this one is red and this one is red, again, this red has to be pushed forward. But then we have a red-red adjacency that's not allowed. Okay, So that is 3SAT to vertex 3 coloring. Cool. Now, uh, this does not preserve planarity uh, because the colors gadget is connected to pretty much everything, and it does not preserve bounded degree. Question? Yeah, the variable gadget doesn't seem to be connected to the clause gadget here. Uh, sorry, I mean, when I say write xi here, I mean it's the same vertex as one okay. of these. Yeah. So there's, if there's n variables, m clauses, going to be two n of these vertices, and then they're shared among the m classes. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to draw because they're actually the same. They're identified as opposed to connected by an edge. Other questions? 
All right, so I think first we make it planar. Uh, we have a new crossover gadget for specific to three coloring. Um, planar three set doesn't seem to help immediately. So we're just going to, because we have all these connections from colors gadget to everybody, uh, so we're going to plug this in whenever we have an intersection. And the idea uh, locally is that whatever color is assigned to this vertex x must be the same as the color assigned to this vertex x prime, and similarly y and y prime. And they're, in, they're free of each other. You can do any assignment to x, any assignment to y, and this will be satisfiable. Uh, give you some colorings to give you, I mean, there's essentially two cases, which is either x and x prime have the same color as y and y prime, or they have different colors. So here's the same color case. You get this nice rotational symmetry. In general, there's, you've got this, uh, s this wheel pattern, uh, four triangles, and that forces, and you have some color here, and then that forces these guys to alternate in the other two colors available around that center. And that essentially communicates the information you need. Um, it's hard to do sort of a straight line argument about why this is the case, other than to just try all the possibilities. Uh, but there's, again, lots of triangles. So once you know this is red, you know one of these is green, one of them is blue. Uh, could go one way or the other at this point. I think you can actually do it one way or the other and just flip all the greens with blues and vice versa. Because green and blue is, in, in this case, is local to the gadget. Um, and anyway, you end up with the, once these two are set red, these two are, are forced to, to be set red by casework. Uh, here is the other case when x, x, x prime is different from y, y prime, uh, or you could say x and y are different, and then again it forces x to propagate through, y to propagate through. We still get alternation here, but uh, it's now the unused color is in the center, whereas before in this picture we had the center color was the color used by all three, or all four of them around the outside. Here it's the color that's not uh, any of those two, and uh, yeah. Again, it's forced by playing around. OK, so that means uh, and we have a figure here about how you actually use this crossover gadget, because there's, there's this issue of identification, which is a little bit subtle. So we, if you have an edge that's crossed by a bunch of edges, you intuitively want to stick this into each of the crossings. Uh, but because this is copying the value here to here, it's really just like taking this vertex and pushing it to the other side of the edge. So when you throw in this crossover, you want to identify the left vertex of the crossover with, with the original vertex on the left side, but not identify it on the right side. Therefore, overall, there's still one edge connecting x and y, because this is essentially a copy of x, but you still need that edge to connect to y. So you don't want to identify on both sides. You don't want to identify on neither side, because that would be two edges. Identify on one side, and just pick, our, it's like a vertex cover, but <laughs> you just pick uh, one side for each edge arbitrarily. And that is planar vertex three coloring, not bounded degree yet. Okay, next reduction, same, all this is in the same paper. Um, here's how to simulate high degree. I mean, it's pretty intuitive. Once you have the ability to copy a color, you can use it to get high degree. Uh, now, uh, okay, I'll talk about the actual degree bound in the moment. I mean, we're, we're, but let's say we're aiming for max degree four. Uh, uh, this one you can actually argue in a very simple way. So here's a little gadget. I claim it makes it three copies of this color, or two copies of the color at x. Um, so you've got these two vertices. One of them's blue, one of them's green. Doesn't matter which is which. But then this vertex must be red because of that triangle. And then this vertex must be green because of that triangle. Then this vertex must be blue because of that triangle. This one must be red, and this one must be red. So that's a e really easy one to argue. And so uh, this is not very interesting because we made two copies. This will simulate a degree three vertex, which we don't worry about. But uh, where it gets interesting, if you just string a bunch of these together here, we end up with five copies of a single color. And so you can connect with a single edge out here, let's say. Um, you could maybe even, I guess you could even forward two edges there. But in particular, we can use this to simulate one vertex uh, and of degree five. And we will end up with max degree 4, degree 4, because some of these vertices have degree 4. Actually, most of them do. Could you have just used the crossover gadget as a high degree gadget? Oh, in a circle. Yeah, that would also work, I think. 
You have a problem? There are degree seven vertices when you put together two of these. Oh. 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 Degree, uh, degree six. Here. Degree six. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So that would give you max degree six, and this gives you max degree four. Yeah. And if we do this after the crossover gadget, then the crossover gadget will become happy. Uh, so. This is, so what's the conclusion? Planar, uh, max degree four, uh, three coloring is hard, uh, but be careful, max degree three, three coloring is easy, polynomial time. Uh, unless your graph is K4, it's the one counterexample, this is always possible. This is called uh, Brooks' theorem from 1941. Uh, so in general, if you have max degree delta, there's a delta coloring unless a couple of things, bad things happen, odd cycle or, um, or complete graph. So that's cool. What do you mean if it's K4 and then it doesn't work? Uh, K4 requires four colors. But K4 has max degree 3. Well, but that's not polynomial to figure out. If there's a 3 coloring? It's, it's polynomial in all cases. Okay. But I'm saying oh, every okay. graph, okay. every max degree 3 graph is 3 colorable except for K4. Oh, okay. So the decision problem is am I K4? Or I guess am I not K4 would be the 3 coloring problem. Yeah. The word planar is not there. Right. Even without planar, uh, it's polynomial. Don't need planarity for that algorithm for testing for K4ness. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I didn't check, but I'm pretty sure what usually once the decision problem is easy, also the actual coloring algorithm is easy, but I didn't check. I assume there's a polynomial coloring algorithm, not just the decision algorithm, but we should double check before you cite that result. <laughs> well, you, can construct construct you make yourself a color gadget and then try probing things. Oh, right. You could reduce the decision problem to the actual coloring problem. You can test whether two guys have the same color by a bunch of probes. Yeah. OK, so what? Why graph coloring? Um, there aren't a ton of proofs that use coloring, because uh, usually 3SAT is simpler, because it only has binary values. But there are situations where coloring is helpful. I have one here uh, that we used in the context of pushing blocks. We covered push stars hard. We covered push, push one is hard. These we covered these two proofs in that lecture, um, and then apply push push. But we didn't talk about push x. Push x was the version where you're not allowed to revisit the same square twice. Like every time you leave a square, it falls down into the abyss behind you, so you can never step on that square again. Um, so uh, our hardness proof for that uses coloring, and I think it's instructive not because I care especially about push 1x, but it seems like a general approach to representing coloring. So good to see the gadgets. First uh, simple idea is that if I have some planar graph, I want to take an Euler tour, a tour that visits every edge exactly twice. Uh, and I want to do that in a planar way. Uh, so the idea is I don't want my tour to come down this way through a vertex and then later come through this way in a vertex. Okay, that's a meaningful thing because uh, I know that planar coloring is hard, so I'm going to reduce from planar max degree 4, 3 coloring. So I've got a planar graph, I draw it in the plane, and then given that relative to that drawing, I want to make sure there's no crossings in my tour that visits every edge exactly twice. These always exist, simple inductive proof. Start with one vertex, visit the star around it, and then just start gluing these things together in an inductive way. You will get uh, a planar Eulerian tour, standard trick. OK, now we're going to use that tour. So here we see an actual graph in the dashed lines, and then we see the Euler tour in the red lines. And I want this to rep, the, and the, the red path is essentially the tour taken by the robot the, that's pushing the blocks around. So it's walking around in some direction somewhere, I think not drawn here, or maybe that. <laughs> I'm going to break this apart, and I'm going to say the robot starts here. There's an obstacle here, and the goal is to get here. So your sole purpose in this puzzle is to start here and get all the way around the loop. And you're just going to be able to go along the red path. But there's some interactions. There's the blue arrows, and then there's the green wiggly lines. 
and that's all you'll need. Uh, one of them is an equal constraint, and one of them is not equal constraint. And the idea is that when you visit a vertex, so let's say you start here at U, I'm going to pick a color, one, two, or three. And there will actually be three red paths here. And then those three red paths will interact with these three red paths to force equality. The wiggly lines mean equality. Uh, so I want that whatever color I've chosen here is the same as the color I've chosen here because I want you to have one color. I'm <laughs> only allowed to assign one color to you. So we're going to look at how to do that equality constraint. Uh, and then we have these types of constraints, which say uh, that the colors are different, non-equal, because I want the color assigned to U to be different from the color assigned to V. And this path was coming from V. So at this point, you ha the color that you're on, you know, which of the red rails you're on, says which color is assigned to V. You want that color to be different from the color assigned to U. Then you transition and say, OK, now I'm going to start over and pick another color between 1 and 3. And then here it's constrained to be equal to this one. So I think the arrows are delineating the transitions from the color. Here it should all be color V. Well, that's, that's maybe not super accurate. But somewhere along this edge, you're going to switch to thinking about the color V to thinking about the color V. You only need one color at any moment. So there will only have to be three parallel tracks for each of these things. That's the high-level picture. Let me tell you how to actually do it. So here's this left part expanded into a slightly more detailed picture. Still a, a bunch of details to be filled in. Uh, but we see still the non-equal and the equal gadgets, just like before. Uh, but here I've explicitly shown the three tracks. Okay, so let's, we were looking at this edge before. So, uh, so let's say, well, here. Here's where you choose the color for you. So we're going to use what we call a fork gadget. We've maybe seen something like this before. When you come in, you can choose one of these three paths. Once you choose, you can't unchoose. There's a one-way gadget. Uh, and so let's say you choose path one. That means that this vertex U is colored one. Then you're going to have some equal gadget. These, these three paths are connected over to here. Uh, but you'll be forced that this path is the same as the one chosen over here. We'll get to that one later. Then you go over here, you're forced that among these three paths, you're different from the three paths over here, because uh, that's going to be the color of V. And then you now want to switch from the U color to the V color. So I'm just going to have some one-way gadgets here that uh, coalesce these three wires into one. And then uh, whatever's next, but let's say this is next, V was a leaf. Uh, then you have a fork again to choose the color for V. So it's kind of weird. You get to choose the color for a vertex several times. Here we're choosing it for U. Here we're choosing it again for U. But they're combined together with this equal gadget, so those two choices are forced to be the same. Okay, that's the, the idea. And then the non-equal gadgets are doing the actual coloring constraint of no monochromatic edges. So it uh, looks complicated, but uh, all you really need are these things on well, the fork in the one way. Let's do the fork in the one way, because those are easy. We've basically seen them before, pretty sure. We did this gadget, the one-way gadget. You can go from A to B, uh, but not from B to A. Uh, cool. So that means when I come through here, I can't back up along some other path. That would be bad. Uh, and the fork gadget, uh, this is a two-way fork. You come in from A, and you can either push this in and then choose to go to C, but then you'll never be able to go to B. Or you can push this down and then go to B, and you'll never be able to go to C. So that's when you make this choice, you can't undo the choice. You just chain two of these together to make a three-way choice. And the one ways prevent you from going back along one of these paths. OK, so that's the easy part. Um, then what about the equal and the non-equal gadgets? These are complicated, but in the end, they reduce to some very simple gadgets. So let's start with the non-equal gadget. So we have three possible color choices for one edge up uh, for the um, for one vertex and we have three possible choices down here for the other vertex together those vertices should form the edge e and this is written as e going one way or e going the other way coming from one vertex and coming from the other vertex end and what we want is to forbid blue blue or to forbid red red or to forbid orange orange and because this, is, this paper was also printed in black and white, the dash patterns also duplicate the color information. So even if you lost all color, you can distinguish these types of lines. 
Um, so we need this gadget, which I'm calling a, or we called a NAND gadget, but you should not have both of these. And there's a couple of different cases depending on the orientation. Uh, but for example, if you go from A to B, you have to push this down, which because this is push one, you only have strength one, you're not able to push up, you're not able to traverse CD anymore if you do A to B. Uh, this is the symmetric version where if you first do B to A, then that prevents CD traversal. And, and it's symmetric, so vice versa. Okay, so that's the gadget that plugs in here. And so now we know that if we follow the path along three, um, that we, uh, the, the blue path for this vertex, we won't be able to traverse the blue path. And so whatever choice you made here at the fork has to be different from this choice. Okay, it's kind of a fun non-local effect. And it doesn't matter, wh whoever makes the choice first will, will block the choice for the other guy. If you had multiple robots simultaneously doing things, then uh, it would get tricky when there's two robots right here at the same time. But probably even then it would work, as long as everything eventually gets traversed. OK, uh, so we prevent, uh, so then we also need some cross limited kinds of crossovers to make this happen because we need to take this orange path. I don't know why it's orange. It should be green, but there you go. Uh, bring it down here and then bring it back up. And so that's going to require the orange path to cross the red path and the blue path. Good news, we know that only one of these will be traversed uh, because we had the fork gadget has that property. If you end up following the one path, you know that two will not have to be traversed. So this is what we called an XOR crossover back when we were doing pushing blocks. It's a crossover that works as long as you only are visiting it once, one way or the other way. Uh, so for example, if you come from, and it's also unidirectional. So if you come from A, you can push that down, but then you won't be able to go to C or D, um, and then you can leave through B. And from C, you can push this over, go to D. Um, and that's, those are the only cases we need with various reflections and rotations. Uh, we either go from up to down here, or we go from right to left here through that XOR crossover. And so you just plug those crossovers in, and you can get each of these paths to where you need them to be. And you know that they'll work, because you won't have to do both of those traversals. Uh, and there you go. So in general, as long as you have an AND gadget and an XOR gadget, then you can do this to make a not equal gadget. So there's a lot of pieces here, but in the end, it reduces to very few things. We had a uh, one-way, a fork, an XOR, and an AND. If you have those things, you can simulate three coloring in this, in this planar way. Now, I didn't cover one more gadget, which is the equal gadget. Uh, it's just a more complicated version of the non-equal gadget. Uh, so <laughs> uh, you need to prevent this one from being blue when the bottom one is orange. You need to prevent this one from being blue when the bottom one is red. And you need to prevent this one from being red when that one's orange. You need to prevent this one from being red when that one's blue. And you know all the pairwise things that you don't want to have happen, just make them not happen. So you can imagine, of course, much more general gadgets than this. We're probably doing much more than three coloring. But uh, again, all we need are the XORs and the NAND. So that proves push 1x is NP-complete. For free, uh, and this, this approach has been used by a couple of papers. So here is uh, another one, push 1g. Uh, this is pushing blocks with gravity. So imagine, this happens in a lot of games. Uh, when you're pushing a block, the block will fall if it ever has a hole below it. Uh, let's say that you don't fall, though. Or you can do lots of jumps and f or flying or whatever. You can do something to avoid. I don't think we'll need any big jumps for this to work. Um, so there are lots of video games that follow these kinds of rules. Here's a one way in that model. Uh, you just uh, push this block over. It will fall. Uh, so you can't push it the other way. Uh, but once you push it forward, it's open. And we're going to denote that with an arrow. Uh, this is Eric Friedman. Uh, and here is an XOR crossover. It's kind of fun. If I come in this way, I push this guy over. It falls down, blocking that path. But I can still go through here. And if I push this one over, the block falls. Uh, and I can go this way, but I'm blocked from going this way or that way. So that, again, works as long as I'm only doing one of the two traversals. Uh, we have a fork gadget, which is familiar. If you're coming up from here, you can push this over. Then you'd be prevented from going the other way because you, will, again, only have strength one and symmetrically the other side. Then the NAND gate. Yeah. 
for the, the XOR crossover, um, when you said you couldn't, when you're going from the bottom one, yep. you push that over, it falls, yep. and then you can't go back up because you couldn't push that block. Uh, yeah, so I maybe need a wiggle here. Yeah. The arrow is already representing the one-way gadget. Oh, yes, good. It's already here because the arrow is a one-way. Forgot the notation. Yeah, it's not the input and the output. This is an actual one-way. Yeah, good. OK. Uh, so and here's a fun thing I learned from reading this paper. You don't even need a NAND gadget because you can simulate a NAND gadget with XOR crossovers. Uh, this is kind of like Jason's idea of using the crossover gadget to make copies um, here. If you, if you traverse through this way um, and through this way, we know that's possible. And if you have a setup where by going through a crossover, you block the other traversal, so that would be a true XOR crossover. Once you do, uh, uh, yeah, so once I push this one over, um, if I tried to go through this way down to here, I would hit the block here that had fallen from there and vice versa. So if it, actually prevents the second traversal. And in push one X, it also prevented the, the second traversal because we had non-crossing paths. We weren't allowed to revisit the same square. So there it was really trivial. Here with gravity, it's a little more subtle because the second time you come through, maybe you could go back that way. But uh, the key thing is that second time you go through, you won't be able to go through in the regular crossover way. And then you just string two of them together and you can either traverse this way or traverse this way and each one will block the other. So. In the end, you just need a one-way fork, an XOR crossover, and some kind of notion of sequential traversal, uh, and you can simulate three coloring. So this is fun. I haven't seen this technique used too much, but in a few papers, and maybe we could use it for more. Uh, cool. I didn't mention, but the push one proofs that we saw before, lecture four or whatever, um, revisit the same square many times. So we can't use those proofs for push 1x. Just the, all the gadgets break. Uh, the next problem I want to talk about, a little different, another graph problem. It's called graph orientation. Kind of like edge coloring, but the colors differ on each side. Uh, so graph orientation. Uh, this is a pretty recent problem. It was introduced in 2012, but I think is very cool and deserves much more study. Um, so you're given an undirected graph. And you want to uh, find an orientation. Orientation means for every edge, you give it a direction. Uh, satisfying certain vertex constraints. And there are three types of, verti of vertices, three types of vertex constraints. They are uh, 1 and 3, 2 and 3, and 0 or 3. They all end in 3. I didn't mention this is a 3 regular graph. Every vertex has degree 3. And so uh, if you look at an orientation, every vertex either has 3 in, 0 out, 2 in, 1 out, 1 in, 2 out, or 0 in, 3 out. Um, and this problem is NP-hard. Here is a simple reduction from 3-sat. Uh, sorry, 1 in 3-sat. So we're going to have a variable gadget, which is just this loop of uh, a cycle in the graph. And for uh, each of these vertices that's a solid black circle is a 0 or 3. So that means in any solution, here's a solution, you're going to alternate between all in and all out, and then all in, all out. So this is going to represent x and x bar. 
you, what the parity of that cycle is is up to you. You could either make the, all the x's all in or all the x bars all in, and that corresponds to x being true or false. I think in means false in this case. And then for the clauses, we're going to have, uh, we're going to use a one and three gadget. Um, it's because that's a one and three sat clause. We want exactly one of these three things to be incoming to the clause. That gives us exactly one of them being set to true. Um, now, here, uh, um, here we're allowing negations. We know that's not necessary for one and three sat, but we can in this proof, so they're drawn here anyway. Um, but to make it a little bit weird, so uh, one issue in this, this style or in this, this reduction, uh, really I just want a whole bunch of copies of x, but I get all these copies of x, pro x bar, and I need to put them somewhere. Every vertex has to have degree 3, so this has to go to something. Um, and so their solution for doing that is for every clause, we also build the anti-clause and make it false. So we want exactly two of the negated versions of these variables to be set to true. That's the same thing as exactly one of the positive forms of them being uh, true. Yes? <laughs> uh, so we just negate everything in the clause. And then wherever we use x, we also use x bar and vice versa. Uh, so that guarantees that we use up all of these instances. If there are k occurrences of x, then we'll make k occurrences of x bar and, turn th and make them all used by the corresponding anti-clauses. So this is why we need those three types of gadgets. We also, if we're doing a problem in the plane, we'll also need a crossover for this to work. Um, but at this point, it's just a graph problem. OK, so that's cool. And this problem was introduced uh, in order to solve a packing problem. A little bit of history. Uh, some time ago, I think the 70s, there was a paper about if I give you a polygon, some orthogonal polygon shape uh, with holes in it, and I want to pack as many, say, 3x3 three three squares in the polygon, that's NP-hard. If I want to pack as many 2x2 two two squares, that's NP-hard. That was a later paper. Uh, and so how much smaller can a squ of a square can you make? Well, uh, one by one square, that's pretty easy. In a grid polygon, how many one by one squares can I pack? With the area. Um, in a grid polygon, how many two by one rectangles can I pack? This way or this way? That's um, maximum cardinality matching. So the next thing left is trominoes, three squares. And they could be in, in an L shape or they could be in an I shape. Uh, here we're st thinking about both problems separately. So suppose you have a whole bunch of L-shaped packages that you want to fit into this weirdly shaped warehouse. Uh, that is NP-hard. It's even hard in the exact packing case. There will be no holes, sorry, there will be no gaps in this packing. Every, s every unit square will be filled. And I think that's quite particular. Th those other proofs of, pa of packing the 2x2 two two and the 3x3 three three square into polygon, I should have shown them, but uh, they're from... 3SAT or planar, th planar 3SAT, they leave gaps all over the place. Here you don't leave gaps, and I think it's somehow fundamental to this graph orientation business. Uh, so here is the idea for an edge in that graph orientation problem. Uh, it's, this, it's basically a rectangle with a bump every other square. So this is a big hole. You're not allowed to put anything down there. And the idea is um, you can either have the L's all pointing to the right or all pointing to the left. And so you think of these as kind of the communication uh, position. Uh, one of these will correspond to the edge pointing to the right. One will correspond to the edges pointing to the left. Okay, And you can build a turn gadget. It works pretty cleanly. It doesn't matter whether this is co covered by that guy or covered by that guy. It behaves the same as a regular wire. So again, it's either this or this is occupied, exactly one of them. And that tells you, the, tells you the orientation of the edge. So that's an edge. Uh, you can also build a crossover. This is a little more casework. But again, uh, if this is occupied, if and only if this is not occupied. And this is occupied, if and only if this is not occupied. And all combinations are possible. You just need to check that there is a valid packing, no matter which of those choices you want, either left and top being empty, or left and bottom being empty, or top and right being empty, or bottom and right being empty. Those are the four cases. Uh, cool. Crossover. Now we need the 
uh, 0, 3, 1 and 3, and 2 and 3. Uh, so they built, instead of a single 0 or 3, they built two in a row. I don't know if this is required, but it's fine for the proof, because in the proof it was always xi, xi bar. So there are always two 0 or 3s in a row. Um, and there it is. <laughs> um, so in, in this setting, essentially, either the left two will have bumps and the right two will not have bumps, or vice versa, the right two will have bumps. This corresponds to uh, these guys all being out in all three directions, these guys all being in in all three directions, or vice versa, these are all out and these are all in. So that's the x or x bar. And this gadget does it. Again, check the cases. Uh, we have a one in exactly one and three. If exactly one of these is in, then this will be packable, and otherwise it won't. That's the part that's hard to show, but you check it. And if you want a two and three gadget, you just add a couple more blocks right there, and it works. Uh, so that's it. Once you have all those gadgets, you can do graph orientation, and then your NPR. That was for L trominoes. Do the same thing for I trominoes. This is hard to see where the bold lines are, but uh, if you look in, if you download the slides, probably a little easier to see. But again, you can build here. An edge gadget is fairly uh, straightforward. <laughs> um, you just wiggle a path, and you'll either have it bump. Uh, this these wiggles are in order to guarantee. There's actually three possible parodies you could have, right? Sticking out by one or sticking out by two with an I gadget. This will force it to be just one or, or zero. Uh, so we because we don't want it to be two. Uh, and then the crossover is ugly, but it works. Um, and the zero or three and the one and three are not too hard. And do I have the two and I think um, this is a two and three. I didn't label it. So Presumably, for any polyomino shape you want, you can build such gadgets, although we don't have such a theorem. Uh, but I think this is neat. It's a little different from a lot of the other proofs, S similar to one of the problem set problems where we had some constraints on the neighboring things. But instead of about constraints on the neighboring colors of the vertices or whatever, or, or the truth assignments in the vertices, here it's an edge direction. So the edge directions are interesting because uh, First of all, there's only two choices, but also that what you see on one side is the opposite of what you see on the other side. Uh, so yeah. Questions? All right, so that is graph orientation. And I have one more set of problems I want to talk about. They have many names, but uh, let's say the general family is usually called something like linear layout of a graph. And it's a bijection, let's call it F, from the vertices to 1 up to the number of vertices. So in other words, uh, thinking of a one-dimensional diagram, and the coordinates I have are 1, 2, up to the number of vertices. And I just want to put exactly one vertex at each of these spots. So it's, I basically want a permutation of the vertices. And then I slap them down in that order. And then I measure something about the quality of that layout based on the edges. We haven't involved edges yet. And there are many different measures you might consider. Um, here are many of them. So, but without definitions, so let me tell you some definitions. Uh, so the first one, one of the earliest uh, to be considered, is called bandwidth. Um, bandwidth is, in, in uh, you know, if you look at an edge, one endpoint of the edge gets mapped to one coordinate, and the other endpoint gets mapped to another coordinate, you can measure the length of that edge in the embedding. I shouldn't call it embedding, because it's not non-crossing, but in the layout. So for some edge VW, measure the length of the edge. If I want to minimize the maximum length of any edge, that is bandwidth. Why is it called bandwidth? Anyone know? No one does matrices anymore. Uh, or numerical linear algebra. So I'll tell you why.
if you have a matrix, let's say of zeros and ones, that's a graph, of course, um, and all of the non-zero elements are in that band, then we call this uh, bandwidth W. Okay, if it's zero out here and zero out here. Why are these interesting? Because then if you run Gaussian elimination, you always stay within the band. Uh, so this was some of the early approaches to solving sparse linear systems. If you can get all the zeros into the, into the corners, then you can focus here, especially if you're tridiagonal is a common case. Anyway, that's called bandwidth. And what this problem is saying is I, I'm allowed to permute the rows and columns of my matrix in order to minimize how many diagonals I need to use. So that is permutation to minimize bandwidth. It would be great, except it's NP-hard. <laughs> so uh, it's NP-hard even on trees of maximum degree three. It's NP-hard even on caterpillars, ca uh, uh, almost caterpillars. Caterpillar is a graph, uh, something like this. Uh, I think this is caterpillar with hair length at most three. So these may be paths of length three. Maybe they even branch a little bit. But every vertex is within distance three of a single path. That's a. So even for such graphs when mapped into matrices, uh, this problem is NP-hard. Lots of cases are NP-hard, even for grid graphs. Okay, that's maybe even, you might think of that as more general, but it's not immediately implied. Okay. Cool, that was bandwidth. Next one, uh, which I've seen used in a few different hardness proofs, is uh, minimum linear arrangement. Almost the same problem, but instead of taking the maximum edge length and trying to minimize that, take the sum of the edge lengths and try to minimize that. That's minimum linear arrangement. We will see a reduction from that in a moment. Uh, it's NP-hard even for bipartite graphs. Cut width. Uh, this is, you draw all the edges as horizontal segments. And then I come in with a vertical line and see how many edges can I cross. I want to find a permutation, so I minimize the maximum, you might call it stabbing width, the maximum number of edges that cross from the left side to the right side, where I take the maximum over all notions of side. Take the maximum over all choices of this x-coordinate, and I want to minimize that maximum. That is cut width. Why do I want to minimize the maximum as opposed to, say, minimizing the sum of those cut values? Because that's the same as minimum linear arrangement. If I minimize the sum of all of these cuts, that's the same thing as minimizing the sum of the lengths of the edges. Right? So that's the same problem. So OK, we got rid of one. <laughs> that was cut width. It's hard for planar graphs, max degree 3, grid graphs, lots of things. Uh, I'm going to skip mod cut. That's just a slight different variation on that definition. Uh, next one is vertex separation. Uh, okay, this is a different way of counting. Um, so here I was counting how many edges cross, but maybe s many of those edges come from the same vertex. I don't want to double count those, let's say. I just want to count how many vertices on the left side have at least one edge that goes to the right side and only count it once instead of th three times in this picture. Okay, same, otherwise the same problem as uh, cut width. That is also hard. Uh, that problem is different if you look at the sum version. So you can uh, count for every partition point how many vertices in the left have an edge to the right side, sum that over all of these x values, and then that is uh, sum cut. All of these have been considered in various contexts. Uh, last one is edge bisection. This is where you only look at cutting in the middle at v over 2. So you want to balance partition all the things on the left. You want to have very few edges to the things on the right. Uh, or the vertex version, where you want to minimize the number of vertices on the left to have edges to the right half, but exactly half, v over 2, v over 2. OK, ton of problems. I mentioned them so that if you ever run into a problem about ordering vertices on a line, you should look at all of those and see which one is the most useful. Sort of like we have 3sat and 1 and 3sat and all equal sat. Choose the one that's easiest for you. If you have some kind of ordering problem, choose the one that's easiest for you. Good to know that these are out there. Um, they come from various applications. Cut width is studied a lot in graph theory, graph minor stuff. Um, it's closely related to path width. 
Um, some of these, pro uh, the bisection comes from uh, numerical linear algebra. Uh, minimum linear arrangement comes, f I think, originally from VLSI layout, you know, chip design. It's like a very simple version. If you just have a bunch of ports on the bottom and you know that certain things need to be connected by wires, that's your graph, you want to minimize the total amount of wire stuff you have to to minimum, minimize the total uh, wire lengths. Uh, so that's minimum linear arrangement. Very simple version of, of some kind of VLSI layout problem. Uh, and there's this survey if you want to see all these problems. Uh, there's one problem not on the survey because it's not about a graph, it's about a hypergraph, but it's a useful one. Among ordering problems, it's the one I know the best. I, I've tried to use it a couple times, but rarely have I succeeded in getting actual NP-hardness proof from it, but I will show you one. Uh, and it is called betweenness. So in this case, I'm given uh, a bunch of triples instead of pairs of things. It's not a graph of the form uh, y is between x and z. And what that means is uh, either it's between x and z in that sense, or it's between uh, x and z in the other sense, where either x is to the left of z or z is to the left of x, but y is always between. And here, of course, I really mean f of x and f of y. I mean them in the Im linear embedding. Okay, so you're given a bunch of triples like this, and then you want to find a linear layout of your letters. Uh, so again, it's a bijection from 1 to n. And uh, you, uh, such that these all hold. So there's no objective function to max minimize here. It's just you want each of these things to be true. Okay, this is nice because it's a pretty clean constraint, and yet it's hard. If I, for example, was just giving you, if I gave you a bunch of inequality constraints, like x is less than y, that's easy. That's uh, sorting a partial order. But here you have a little bit of ambiguity. Uh, you don't know how x and z relate. You just know that y is in between them. That's enough to get hardness. So I'm not going to prove any of those problems hard, but I will show you two examples of hardness proofs from, uh, first one is going to be from minimum linear arrangement. In case you haven't already memorized all of the problems I just described, <laughs> let me remind you. Minimum linear arrangement uh, was minimize the sum of the edge lengths. That was the second problem I described. That was like the VLSI layout. Minimize the sum of all the red lines. Find the permutation that does that. So uh, we're going to reduce it first to a problem called bipartite crossing number. It's a bit of a weird problem. It's mostly a stopgap on the way to another problem, which is crossing number. Suppose you're given a bipartite graph, which is hard to see in this picture. Uh, you're given a bipartite graph. And you want to draw it in the plane. So uh, some bipartite graph. I want to draw it in the plane in, in, or, uh, in a special way. I want all of the vertices uh, on in one side of the bipartition to be on a horizontal line. I want all the vertices in the other uh, side of the bipartition to be on a parallel horizontal line. Okay, and all the edges are in between, they're straight lines. And I want to minimize the number of crossings. Okay, so it's this very specific kind of graph layout problem, but minimizing the number of crossings is clearly good. We want to draw as planar as possible. So here's a reduction from minimum linear arrangement to bipartite crossing number. So, uh, in this problem, we're given a general graph, not necessarily bipartite. We want to convert it into a bipartite graph. How do we do that? Make two copies of every vertex. OK, so for every vertex in the minimum linear arrangement problem, we're going to make two copies, uh, call them bottom one and top one, top two and bottom two, bottom two and top two, and so on. So there's the there's n top vertices and bottom vertices. And I'm going to do two things. One is. Uh, connect a whole bunch of edges, and a whole bunch means e squared, uh, and between bottom i and top i. OK, 
Okay, I just do that. That will basically force this kind of layout where uh, basically the order on the top has to be identical to the order on the bottom. Because if ever any of these two bundles of edges crossed, you would get e to the fourth crossings. And so if you ever want to get less than e to the fourth crossings, and that's what we will hopefully do, then these must appear same order on top and bottom, but we don't know what the order is, right? That you could still permute the bottom, just correspondingly can permute the top, and uh, all will be well as far as these edge bundles go. So that's good because it has exactly the flexibility. We have exactly one permutation on n things. That's what we want to represent with minimum linear arrangement. Then the only other thing we do is add in the edges of the graph. But in the, in the minimum linear arrangement problem, the edges are like from vertex i to vertex j. We're going to make that a connection from bottom i to top j. And there's this choice, but it doesn't matter which is which. So the idea is then that edge will cross a bunch of bundles. The number of bundles it crosses is the length of the edge minus 1, I think. So I'll, I'll ignore these uh, additive constants. You have to be careful to make sure everything adds up the right way. Um, if if you have a length zero edge, well, you never have a length zero edge because vertices map to different places. If you have a length one edge, you won't cross anything. So that's zero crossings. If you have a length two edge, you will cross exactly one bundle. Uh, and you pay e squared for that. In general, it will be something like e squared times the sum of the lengths of the edges. Not exactly. You have to subtract off some things. But for the, um, you just compute what that is. It will always be uh, basically some, some fixed constant times the minimum linear arrangement cost, which was the sum of the lengths of the edges, uh, plus some fixed constant. And so you can solve the bitorotite crossing number, which is a given speci specified number of crossings, if and only if you can solve minimum linear arrangement with a specified sum of edge lengths. Question. What about the crossings between edges? Uh, yes. There's also crossings between edges. Um, and that's, you have to count them. It's fine because you can't get more than d squared of those yeah. uh, right. in the normal case. Yes, so, so that will be in the noise. Uh, the bulk of the number of crossings will be, uh, will be from the crossing the bundles with the single edges. You can never, you don't want to have bundle-bundle uh, crossings. Th those you can never afford. So you're basically counting bundles versus single edges. The total number of single edge crossings will be strictly less than e squared. And so it will be strictly less than a single guy crossing a bundle. So, so you, have to, you have to inflate. It's not an exact counting, because you don't know how many of those single edge crossings you're going to get. Uh, so you have to add almost uh, e squared. I have the exact count here. I don't know how interesting it is. But it, what they wrote is it's e squared times k minus e plus 1 minus 1 is the exact number in the paper. K here is the, total, the sum of the lengths of the edges in that problem. This is, um, I think, the minus 1 per edge. All that gets multiplied by e squared. And then we're basically adding e squared minus 1 at the end. So almost e squared to allow for any number of crossings between the single guys. Good. Does make a lot of sense. OK, so that was bipartite crossing number. But the more natural problem, I would say, is I give you a graph. I want to draw it in the plane with fewest crossings. That is crossing number. And it's a reduction from the previous problem. So uh, basically, you can force these vertices to be on a horizontal line and these vertices to be on a, another horizontal line and to only have edges between here and here by adding huge bundles out here to basically prevent anything from going out there. And so remember now, we're given a bipartite graph. We want to draw it in this kind of way, minimizing number of crossings in between. And so this will turn that into a, a general graph. It's uh, actually still bipartite. But now the planar embedding is forced, more or less. I mean, it's not an embedding. Keep using that word. The planar drawing is more or less forced. You can show these guys have to be in this kind of topology. And then there's some crossings in here. But none of these edges could ever cross this, because this is way more than the number of crossings in the input graph. Yeah? What about uh, not multigraphs? Not multigraphs. Good question. I assume, I assume you can split these things up, or maybe subdivide the edges, or some, 
some trick, but I have to be very careful. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Definitely not mentioned in this paper. Okay, so that was crossing number, bipartite, and unconstrained. And I have one more sketch of a proof, uh, which is mostly for fun. Uh, and I get to use my favorite phrase, how to kill log n birds with one stone, or order one stones. Uh, so suppose you have a Rubik's cube, but you know, three by three by three, that's easy. So <laughs> you have an n by n by n Rubik's cube, like this seven by seven by seven v cube. Uh, and you know, moves are, I assume you've all know how a Rubik's cube works. You can rotate in each of these directions. Uh, and I hope not to <laughs> mess it up too much. Um, and your goal is to get to this state where it's all solved. Now, usually you know, someone's mean and they mix it all up and they just give it to you and like, okay, solve it. I don't just want to solve it. I want to solve it with the fewest moves because it's polynomial time to solve it at all. I want to solve it in the fewest moves. So if I'm given this position, I want to know it's only one move away from solved. Sad, uh, we do not know the complexity of that problem. Let me first tell you... Uh, an easy way, or uh, a nice way to think about this problem is actually in the 2D case. So these are not <laughs> built super large, but again, I can rotate either a row or a column. So at a high level, you can think of the picture like this. You have a red side and a blue side, and there's a, a certain, uh, it's if you think about where the square goes, it can go to this position, to this position, and this position. In general, one, a little cube, can only go to four different spots in 2D. On the 3D cube, there's 24 spots it can go to because there are 24 automorphisms of the cube. It's just a lot harder to see, but it's essentially the same thing going on. So here's a, a sort of thing you could do. If I flip this column, these guys go over to here and they flip upside down. So whatever was red here becomes blue down here and it gets reflected across this line. So when I do this move, I get this pattern for that row, that column. If I also do it at this column, uh, I get that pattern. Okay, so now maybe I do these two columns, they fl completely flip, become all blue. Now maybe I do these two columns and I get this picture because these red spots become blue up here uh, and, and so on. And then if I flip these two rows, hey, I solved the puzzle. Okay, and in general, if you look at a QB and the four, p the four other QBs that it can go to, they have some pattern. There's a constant number of patterns they can have. For 2D, it's, I forget, like uh, 10 or 20 different patterns. In 3D, it's like a lot more. <laughs> uh, billions or something, anyway. Uh, but it's constant, even for an n by n by n cube. Uh, and so you can characterize for each such pattern whether it, uh, what it needs to be solved. So these QBs, for example, need a column, row, column, row. That's what we showed. We flipped its column, then we flipped its row, then we flipped its column, then we flipped its row. That solved it. That's exactly what they need. And in minimal solution, you will do that. But what you see here is, if, if suppose I had a big grid of them, I could do all the columns, then all the rows containing them, then all the row columns, then all the rows. If they were in the same initial pattern, I get a, a big savings in how quickly I can solve it. Uh, if I have an x by y a grid of, of identically oriented QBs, I can solve it at about x plus y moves instead of x times y moves. And this is something we use to prove that you can solve an n by n by n Rubik's cube in n squared divided by log n moves in the worst case. So you can kill log n birds with one stone. There's always such a grid uh, of area roughly log n. Okay, but uh, here I want to do it for, I want to use that idea for hardness in some sense. That was to give you some intuition. Uh, sadly, we don't know whether this problem is NP-hard, minimizing the number of moves. But what we do know is that if some of the stickers fell off your cube, then it's NP-hard. So the white things here are don't care. So you don't care whether what state they end up in. They're sort of wild cards. So it could be the sticker came off, or maybe it, it just changes its color to whatever is correct at the moment. Uh, but some of the stickers are still on, and they have to be solved. And this is a reduction from betweenness. Uh, this gadget will be solvable in a certain number of moves if and only if the first time you make uh, the x2 column move is between the first time you make the x1 column move and the x3 column move. I think these are in the situation that they want to do column row, column row. 
something like that. So each one is going to get used twice. It's a matter of how you intersperse those orders. So it's an ordering problem, and this ends up being between us. I will not go through the proof. It's uh, quite tedious. Uh, but basically, so this column is going to get used many times in the reduction. You basically, you just work in the upper left corner of the picture be uh, because the other quarters sort of mo move similarly. Uh, we, you introduce some extra rows and columns that are specific to this between this gadget. And uh, if you want to have more between this gadgets, you add more such columns and rows uh, to in this pattern. And as long as they're sort of off diagonal from each other, they won't interact. And so you end up with a big betweenness reduction. Uh, so that's it for today.